Thank you so much, uh, Suleiman Natchez of Tumba. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Live Real Talk, where tonight uh, we are talking about the enemy within. We are talking about cancer. Is it time for it to be declared a national disaster? Without further ado, we'll be playing you the clip that the president just I think opened. It's important for all of us the president just opened it. the uh, executive the meeting we yesterday, Thursday, is which is uh, August the first. Thirty-two thousand nine hundred and eighty-seven lives, at least on an annual basis, being taken away by cancer. And uh, the year 2018 alone, we had at least forty-seven thousand eight hundred and eighty-seven cases of cancer with 12.5% of them being breast cancer. I mean, it's, the figures are crazy, very crazy. This is according to Global Cancer Observatory. Let's listen to what uh, the president said uh, yesterday when he was uh, opening his cabinet meeting. I think it's important for all of us to, to, to recognize that in a very public way, these, these two deaths have... Uh, highlighted the very real threat and danger that many Kenyans are exposed to through, through cancer. And what all of us need to do, and especially us as government, to really come up with a very clear policy to help our fellow Kenyans in this particular, in this particular fight, because it is definitely a crisis. These two deaths just highlight something that has probably hit every single family in this republic, and really for all of us to redouble our efforts in that particular fight and to see what more we can do to assist both in prevention but also in treatment of this disease. And we need to do that as a government together with our county governments. So I think it was just important for us to highlight that that is an issue that I think we need to take a lot more seriously and galvanize all of us to really come up with an answer, a solution, both preventative, which is what is most important, but also in helping our Kenyans get treatment and to get treatment early for those who succumb to this, uh, um, to this illness. That was the president of Kenya, Mr. Uhuru Mugia Kenyatta, who acknowledges that uh, this has become, has gone overboard basically for as far as uh, the fight against cancer is concerned. And I'm not alone in the studio, of course, as always. I'm joined by an amazing panel who will help me break this down and uh, discuss the treatment, the causes and the contributions. And is it really a death sentence when one is diagnosed with this enemy within? Starting from my immediate left, we have Dr. Sitna Mwanzi, who is an oncologist from the Aga Khan University, Karibu mm -hmm. Sana. And sitting next to her, of course, we have uh, Ms. Husna Hassan, who lost her husband from this tragic disease, of course. And last but not least, on studio, we have uh, Mr. Moses Sotien, who is a five years cancer survivor. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Starting with you, Dr. Sitna, why the sudden raise? in the cases regarding cancer, it's, it's, it's something that we were not familiar with some years ago. But again, now, left, right, and center, almost everywhere, it's cancer, cancer, cancer. It's uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, viewers. Um, um, so I, I, uh, I mean, as an oncologist, cancer is not new to me. So we've been having um, patients for a long time. Um, I think that because of increasing awareness and people knowing more about the disease, it kind of feels like there are more cases. Of course, um, every year there are more and more cases being um, diagnosed. Um, there are several factors to this. One of the things our healthcare has improved, so there are more facilities in terms of detecting and treating the disease. So naturally, there are more and more people coming forward for, for testing and, treat and treatment. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that there's an actual increase in the number. We've changed quite a number of things. So we've changed our lifestyle. We've changed how we eat. Um, so we've changed quite a bit of what we do that increases our risk for cancer. So it's not just um, 
the fact that we have better health care, but also because we've changed how we live. What are some of those things that um, you think might be contributing? I mean, you've You've, you've mentioned that we've changed quite a number of things and yeah. that uh, totally attributes to lifestyle, of course, yeah. of which it's also a sentiment that the president echoed earlier on uh, this afternoon during um, Honorable Her Excellency Jess Lavoso's funeral, right. lifestyle. So yeah. what are some of those things that are quite notable that you yeah. can say we've changed and they have immensely contributed to the spread of this disease? So one of the things is that people are smoking more. So spo smoking accounts for a large percentage of um, different types of cancers, not just lung cancer. Um, the second thing, we are less active. So we are uh, walking less, we are exercising less. And then we've adopted a more Western uh, in, uh, lifestyle in terms of uh, eating more processed foods, eating less vegetables, eating more fruits. Uh, fruits and vegetables are protective for certain types of um, um, cancers. Um, and then, so this is not a new phenomenon. So like in, in, the, in Western countries, at the period of uh, before industrialization, they saw a, a, an increase in the number of cases. And mm -hmm. when they became industrialized, mm -hmm. some cancers increased and some cancers reduced. So there are also environmental factors that have, so there's more pollution now than there was before. So all these things contribute to the disease. The other thing for us in Kenya is that we have a high burden of cancers that are related to infections. Okay. So I if you look at HIV itself, it's an infectious disease, but it increases your risk for cancers such as cervical cancer, which is the second most common cancer in women in Kenya, and then also increases other cancers like a cancer called Kaposi sarcoma and lymphomas. So there are these cancers that are related to infections. We also have a high rate of hepatitis B, which leads to um, liver cancer. So apart from just having other causes of cancers, we have a high infectious burden that actually accounts for other types of cancers. Interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. And um, the last time we had this discussion in studio here, we had some um, laboratories, you know, from uh, one of the largest private laboratories in East Africa. And we spoke about the study of the disease and if there are any proven factors that are directly attributed to, to, to causing cancer. We'll get uh, more of that. Mose, yes. five years survivor. Yes. When were you diagnosed with cancer? Okay, first of all, thank you for having me. I was diagnosed with cancer 2014. I was still a high schooler, Roraka High School. Um, my first experience with cancer, it wasn't easy. Uh, this was a new field for me. I never knew anything about cancer. So it just started like a normal pain at the knee. I told my parents, hey, mom, I'm not feeling OK. Something might be wrong. And they told me, ah, I know you. You're a footballer, maybe. You got an injury from the field. He brought some warm water and robe, massaged the leg. For a moment, I felt some relief, but it didn't work. So it continued for like that for two months, and then now the school were closed. Came January. When I was at the parade opening assembly, I fainted. My dad was called to school, and he was told, your son, has just fainted, we don't know what's wrong with him, just come. He came, because he knew the situation, we went to Nema Hospital. Some x-rays were done, and then we were sent to Kiambu. At Kiambu, the doctor looked at the x-rays. The next thing, he wrote a referral letter to Kenyatta Hospital. So there is where my journey started. That was now January. We went to Kenyatta, started looking for a bed, and I was admitted mid-February. A uh, biopsy test was done, that now was March, and then I was discharged for one and a half months while waiting for the results. So when the results were out, I went back to the hospital, and then I was told, now you have bone cancer, and the only solution is surgery. That was very, very frustrating. I felt bad as a young man. Now, where is my life going? What next for me? Who will want to associate with me? But I decided life is important. Did you know anything about cancer before? I that? didn't know anything about cancer. That was the first time you had a first time to hear the word cancer. So 
all I used to hear was, oh, Nani has cancer and he died. Nani has cancer, she died. Nani has cancer. So I was, I was very terrified. I thought that was the next line for me, but I trusted God. I underwent through surgery and I came out of it alive. Now it's been five years. I thank God for everything. Wow, interesting. Ms. Osna, um, you, you've gone through a rough time with your late husband. May Allah put his amazing soul in Jannah. Mm -hmm. How was it, your journey with him? It was a rough journey in the beginning because it's some of these things you don't expect it to be so close at home. One. And two, you don't expect it to on somebody you care so dearly about. Somebody who's being cautious about his lifestyle. Somebody who's been eating well. Somebody who's been doing exercise. He'll be like, everyone has to do exercise. You should have vegetables in the house, fruits and all that. And more so for somebody who's a doctor. And once it started, we didn't know what was the cause because it will always be stomachache, stomachache. After stomachache, it moved to backache. And uh, because we might be like, hey, you're a doc, you should, I mean, seek treatment, just be checked, what is it? And uh, after all the screenings, nothing showed up. And because I met him quite early, around 97, 1997. So it continued, continued to the point I'm like, ah, being a doctor, why are you letting this happen? Why don't you go and to be checked to know exactly what is, what is the problem? But the stomachache will come and subside. And once the pain comes, it's so sharp and it will subside. After some time we stayed because it'll just be going on off checkup on medication. At one point we thought it was ulcers, you know. But in 2006, July, actually 2010, July, that's the time he informed me that, oh, you know, I went for another screening, I went for another biopsy, and they found something because by then they never found it's like it's cancer cancer so it was just barely assumption yes so they just found something small small like a button you know being a lame and the way he was telling me just something yeah, small you know and uh, because by then i had my second baby so i was like okay and being anxious was like all this time we've never known what it is and being I mean, a laparoscopic surgeon. I was like, this is something small. They just go in, remove this thing, and come out, you know? If you can just allow me, I'm uh, getting directions that uh, there's something that we just need to go on a very short break as we fix your microphone. It's uh, not so well. Don't go away. I want to hear the rest of the story. Don't go away. Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. Am I allowed as a woman to ask for a divorce in a marriage that I feel it's not working? Yes, you're allowed to ask for divorce, so long as that divorce you're asking is in accordance with the teachings of Islam. I always caution ladies, women, married women, not just to jump for divorce and ask for divorce, maybe because the man used to have money, he could provide, now he's not able to provide, or because of any materialistic issues. So yes, that is a right you have, as long as it is according to the teachings of the Quran and the son of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.
you're watching Horizon TV the beacon for the nation Twenty nine minutes past eight PM and we are here talking about this enemy within, something that has affected us directly and indirectly, our loved ones. Some of them have made it through. Some of them, despite the fact that we agree that at some point, Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah, it's 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 his decree that uh, we all have to taste from the magic cup of death at some point. But again, humanly the human side, the human perspective. We want to integrate and look at, we want to, to really divulge into the reason behind it. Is it something that can be worked on? Is it something that we can reduce the cases? That's why we're talking about this enemy within, talking about cancer. And we are listening about the late Professor Hassan Saidi. How was it? Ms. Osna, you saying something? Uh -huh. So... We decided to go for the surgery. It was just a long day. Because by then we knew we had to go in very early in the morning at the Aga Khan Hospital and come out quick. And we had uh, approximated it will be like an hour surgery. And uh, the idea was being a doctor, he felt I can just go alone. I was like, no, it's a surgery. How, why, why would you want to go alone? So on in insisting we went, and by then I was like, ah, my husband is a doctor, there's no worry. So he took he himself back. to the theater, he left me, I signed the documents. And by then, because your mind is going so fast, I never read it. I was like, ah, my husband has read it, so I'm fine. So he, then I was guided to the waiting area at the theater. They started, because he would talk, talk, because his voice was very conspicuous then. Suddenly he went quiet and the operation started. It took one hour, two hours, three hours, you know. And for a layman to be told, you know, oh, we found something in the stomach, so we had to cut, we had to join it again. So I'm thinking, of oh, how do they cut these intestines and start joining again, you know? After four hours, I started panicking because I'm like, this is not going okay. And by then, because Google, I didn't have internet on my phone, so I had to be calling my colleague, can you Google for me this? I'll hear one word, I'll be like, Google for me, you know? Finally, by one o'clock, the hospital administrator noticed I was there. And then she's like, why are you keeping her here? Because everything they're saying, it was coming to my mind. I'm like, no, God, this can't be happening. And by the time I was being taken to his ward, and it was a different, it was just lots of confusion, commotions for me. And when I said, maybe being there, I'm making it difficult for them, they may not be concentrating. And at one point they started, he was reacting, and you could physically hear the doctors running within the theater, you know? So once they, were take, they took me to the room, and I had to pray. My legs were weak, I couldn't walk, you know? It took almost three hours again for him to be brought in. And when I saw him, I knew I'd lost my husband. And I couldn't just stand up, you know? They did their stuff, oxygen is not joining in. They're trying to wake him up. He's not waking up. I was like, God, what is this? So after they left, I had to walk using the wall to reach him, but on touching him, is very cold. I'm like, no, this is not right. So I called the nurses, they were very quick, they responded, they came. And after the friends came back, they started like, hey, you, you've been doing this surgery on people, wake up, you know, why are you taking this long? Interesting thing, he woke up, very lively, and even laughing, you know? And that's the time, he's like, why, why have you left her here all this time? And because it's like, she needs to go see the baby. So I left him okay. But you see now, it's like now you're next to the chemo room. Your mind is running. And finally, it's like we had that talk with him. It's like, hey, I have cancer. And interesting, it's what type of a cancer. He's like neuroendocrine tumor. I was like, okay, what the hell is this? And what does it mean, you know? And that's when we went into the discussion with him. It's not treatable. 
are not treatable. I'm thinking, God, my kids, what's going to happen? And I started, because some questions I couldn't ask him directly, I'll go to other doctors. I was like, is it transferable? You know, is it inherited? And all that. But Alhamdulillah, we said we're going to take it as it is because there's nothing much you can do. So we accepted cancer. And accepting it, also my big brother had cancer, but he had for the esophagus. So I was like, God, is cancer becoming my portion in life, you know? But for my husband, we decided it's like living a day at a time because you never know, you know? And at one point, I'll be like, you don't mind about it because maybe I'm the one who will die first. So we had quality life for eight good years. After, after discovering that he had cancer, you had eight good years? We had eight good years and we had alhamdulillah quality life. And the thing is, how do we break this news to other people? Because even doctor here was a student and most of them didn't know about it. And still he was still on medication you know because always believing and even his phd was on neuroendocrine tumor you know just trying to find what is the cause how can it be prevented why do you have to live with it as in it has to have its normal lifespan you know and it was a tough time after december 2016 that's when because from advising me, preparing me, but you can never be prepared enough, you know, then it's be like once an organ of the body start failing, it will be a good sign. So the swelling started and by then even me, I was doing my Google research, trying to get as much information as possible. For me, it was like, this is a danger sign, you know? Then I'm like, ah, because I, I went to work out. I'm like, did you, did you stop your medication? Have you, what is it? Have you changed it, you know? Then he, he simply told me, you know, after some time, the body reacts to medication for this long. And then in January, he's like, just go back to work. You know, I'll be okay, you know? And even we made promises to each other. If it gets worse, I'll call you back. I went to work in Nigeria, coming back after two months, because we'll be on phone, we will talk, how, how is everything? But coming back in April, I was like, God, no, this is just not hacking it up. And again, he convinced me, I'm strong enough, just go back to work because he worked till last minute. Going back to work, definitely your mind is back home, you know? Yeah, you, you, definitely you, you won't be at peace. You wouldn't, that peace is not there. And once the phone rings, you're practically jumping. Oh then my nanny is like, hey, look for your husband. I'm like, what? He's like, your husband has gone to hospital. I just collapsed on my seat in the house in Nigeria and trying to figure who do I call from Aga Khan because already I knew the doctors and they, they became more or less of our family friends. So calling and calling from Nigeria, you know, they know these are pranksters, you know, yeah. con men. So the doctor never picked up. I'm like, what the hell? I got another person to call. I'm like, get for me the number for the doctor. So finally I was like, when it, I realized that, I said, let me just send a text. I like, hey, this is me. Can you pick up the phone? Just on that. If I can bring you in, Dectary, there's this notion about cancer. We've seen the lot uh, Professor Hassan Saidi living at least eight years, giving him a head sort of eight years. We've seen um, Honorable MP Ken Okoth from the time he was diagnosed up to the time he, he died. It was 2017 to 2019. Mm -hmm. We've seen Bob Colimo again, quite a long period. And we've seen Mose, five years, perfectly fine. Is this a death sentence? I mean, as it's being perceived by others out there that yeah. this is a death sentence. Or what exactly is it? How exactly is it, Victoria? Um, I think the, the first uh, myth to, to break is to think of cancer as one disease. Mm -hmm. and Actually, cancer is a group of diseases, and within that group, there are very many different 
um, subtypes of the disease. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, the way that a breast cancer patient would behave is different from the way a leukemia patient would behave. So, when people hear cancer, they think that, like Professor Hassan said, this cancer is the same <coughs> as Moses' cancer, and those are completely different and they're going to follow different paths. And then even within different cancers, for example, we have a cancer called lymphoma and they're about a, a hundred different subtypes and they all each di um, behave differently. So saying cancer is a death sentence is not true for majority of the patients because you already have a, a live ex uh, example. Ex example. And then you also have an example from our late professor who from the time he found out he had cancer, he had eight good years of of his life. So even though you could have cancer at a late stage, doesn't mean that you're going to die imminently. You can have a long period of time when you are on treatment for the disease. So but of course, that's determinant of the stage of the cancer. Yes. Exactly. And so it's de de uh, how long you live or how well you do depends on the type of cancer that you have mm -hmm. and on the different characteristics of that type of cancer okay. that you have. At what stage was that cancer and after that doctor replied to you, I mean, what, what happened? Mm, it was already in its uh, third stage by then when we, re we noticed it, which was, it's like because it had progressed its full cycle, then it had already attached itself to the heart, Mr. 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 Media Sina. Yeah, that word, <laughs> already attached to the heart, so they were actually they just able to deal with the the surgery of the stomach remove those but for the heart now it was a, a little bit harder and uh, that's when it went to by december as you're talking already it was in fourth stage that's the time you that's could, where the reaction started with the body. yeah that's the time you could start seeing him changing the swelling started coming and for him it's like he tried being a doctor, he knew it's like I have to wear these pressure socks, you know, I had to take care of my back and all that with his uh, medication. So by July is when, June is when I noticed things are not good at all because now the weight has tremendously reduced, the eating has reduced because he became so sen sensitive to almost everything, perfume, handshake, you know, and uh, that's the time it's like uh, trying to see which is the best way. But still he could go to work, but you could notice he's a bit weak. But then I was meant to go back to work and I was like, no, he's like, I'm just fine, just go, you know, being him very encouraging yes. till last minute. But I not noticed he couldn't even raise there blanket to cover himself and the blanket is very very light and i think that's the time i said eh, this work it can just stay on the side it's not adding up and not adding up because that's the night we had eat celebrations we had many visitors you know not knowing what effect it will have on his heart because already the right heart side had already gone you know so we are like, midnight is when it's like he just collapsed on bed and I could notice he's just, the breathing has changed, the sweating has come in. That's when we had to rush him to Aga Khan Hospital and on arriving he was resusc resuscitated and we started, uh, that is vigorous hospital care with all the doctors, they were quite supportive, all the nurses were there supportive. And it's the time we had that hard talk, it's like, you don't have time, you know? Definitely I was hysterical because I'm like, what do you mean we don't have time, you know? And it was hard, because at the time the hospital was like, you know, there's nothing much we can do. And I'm like, so, you know, feeling so helpless. They're like, you need to take him home, a place where he's comfortable. And I think then that's the time I was like, okay, God, help me here, because I don't know what to do. And with the family support, we were able to take him home for home care. And again, I thank God for the friends. 
because without them, I don't know how I'll have managed. Once you're talking about how do you manage a terminal ill patient, because our house had to be practically changed into a hospital. And for me, I say Alhamdulillah, because by then we could afford the insurances we had, the friends who came in handy for us. So we are able to manage, we are able to take care of him, we are able to provide physiotherapy and manage the pain because in essence it was you have to make him comfortable and making him comfortable it was also another stage because I had to be given crash course on how do you manage a terminal ill person because by then eating the food quantity had, had reduced so much once he eats it's alhamdulillah God's miracle happens because it will be digested immediately so it's not being absorbed into this body system so we had to go to feeding him through the vein and the intravenous feeding also you have to be the hygiene the oxygen has to be there you know and being confined in one place it's it was just another thing altogether and because by then the hospital was like, oh, you guys, the time you have is less than a month. And I'm like, subhanAllah, why would you want to define a time for somebody? Being a Muslim, I said, it's only God who knows when that time will reach. And that's the time I think, I don't know, maybe I became overstrong. God's blessing was just too much for me. And I said, let me not look at this bit, you know. Let me look at the time we have together and make it much quality. And then you had kids there. How do you start explaining to them that, you know, your dad has cancer? That was just a tough discussion for me because they're like, we've never seen dad like this. And because his bed, we've changed it. We had to put the repo mattress and all that. The oxygen, once you put it on, the kids will be wondering, what is it, you know? Alhamdulillah. Wow. Mm. Reverse 818 say cancer can be changed from being an enemy depending on the stage one is at. We have uh, the last two and a half years has been seeking medical attention done, tests given, different tests until in May. We have uh, Charming Sal says, May Allah reunite her and her husband in Jannah, true love in sickness and in health. Amen. We have Suleiman Natchez on Twitter saying, wonderful. Thanks so much for your feedback. Uh, it's, uh, just don't go away. Gonna be back. Let's look at uh, the treatment. Let's look at how do you soldier on. Let's, I mean, we have uh, eight years of quality life. We have Moses, five years cancer warrior. And I'm sure we have many others at home. Let's talk about this after the break. Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. as a woman to ask for divorce in a marriage that I feel it's not working. Yes, you're allowed to ask for divorce so long as that divorce you're asking is in accordance with the teachings of Islam. I always caution ladies, women, married women, not just to jump for divorce and ask for divorce maybe because the man used to have money, he could provide, now he's not able to provide, or because of any materialistic issues. So yes, that is a right you have as long as it is according to the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're watching Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. Welcome back. 
Um, welcome back. Talking about the enemy then, um, cancer. Moses, uh, it's, it's five years now. You, you have battled, uh, you've battled it and, and, and you are a warrior. You've shown people that this is not the end of life and it's not a death sentence per se, but you can fight through it. What are you doing to your own capacity as a warrior to spread this message and awareness to the general community about the disease? Okay, after my amputation, it's you amputated? Yeah, I was amputated 7th of July 2014, and I started a new life now as a disabled person. But that did not define me because it doesn't matter how you appear, how you look, your physical appearance. What matters is life and what you have. What can you give back to the society? So after being discharged, I went home, stayed for about one, one year adapting the new life. So after that is when I decided to take this initiative of creating cancer awareness. Because at my time, I didn't know what cancer is, what cancer was. I didn't know how to manage it, how to, to tackle it, where to go for treatment. So mm -hmm. it was hard for me and my family. So I took up this initiative. Nowadays, I create cancer around Korokocho, Kariobangi area, because many people are dying, many people are suffering, not because of treatment mostly, but because of lack of information. They don't know where to go first, who to go to, where to seek treatment, how to do prevention. So if we first start with prevention, we can even avoid, avoid treatment. So that's why I decided to take this initiative. I've been doing awareness. And for the past, I think now it's two years. Yeah. The third cancer is treatable. And, and and that's what we we're getting, and uh, we can get quite some quality good time. Yeah. Do we have the resources for early detection of cancer? That is one question. But even before that, um, you mentioned about lifestyle. But you find someone in the rural areas, not in the urban towns, in the rural areas. You're just reading a man in in Westport Court suffering from skin cancer. This is someone deep down in the rural areas. We cannot say he's consuming processed food. We cannot say he's not doing as much exercise because as you can clearly see from the picture, he's this old man in a shuka. And I mean, again, cancer, is it preventable? Yeah. Um, I think we, we, we don't know so much about cancer that we'd like to know. So what we know now is about 40% of cancers are preventable. So we have this 60% where we really don't know what causes it. Uh, for example, for neuroendocrine tumors, it's very, we don't know why this cancer happens in certain people and in other people. So when we are saying, um, is cancer preventable, we probably will only be able to prevent 40% of cancers by these things we're talking about, um, um, diet, exercise, not smoking, reducing alcohol intake. But majority of the cancers, 60%, we will not be able to, to prevent them. And I think this is a key message um, because, as you said, the people who are having a good lifestyle, they're not exposed to environmental toxins. Um, because of the nature of where they live, they are walking a lot and you know they're exercising in their normal lives and they still come up with cancers. And the truth is for majority of the patients, we don't know. Having said that, if you can prevent 40% of the cancers, that's a huge number of patients that you can actually um, you know, reduce. I said we're looking at 29 survivors out of at least possible 39,000. I'm looking for this figure. Yeah. Is it, uh, let me just confirm so that I read, uh, 4,380. Of those who want to looking at only 29 survivors, and we are talking yeah. of treatment of cancer. Yeah, so so that's that's a, a it's a key point. So one one of the things is 
there are different ways in which you can manage cancer. So the first thing is, uh, and people think of cancer as a disease, but uh, ca cancer is a multi, it can be affected by many things. So um, if you're looking at preventive medicine, it starts from childhood. So what are we feeding our children as they're growing up? How, what kind of things are they being exposed in the environments? Because these risk factors are there, but they accumulate over time. So these are things we can try and start working on now, making sure that levels of pollution are low, that we are giving them the right diet, that we uh, encourage them not to smoke and encourage them not to take alcohol, they become more physically active. Those things are um, things we can start on early. If you look at the food sector, we can reduce the amount of processed foods that um, we allow. We can increase taxation in things like tobacco and alcohol. So there are many, it's a multi-level and multi-sectoral approach to prevention, just instead of saying, look at the individual, but what about the whole society and the whole economy? And like I said, there are other things that you can do, for example, for infections. We have uh, cervical cancer, which is the second most common cancer in women. 99% of those cancers are caused by a virus, and this is preventable using a vaccine. So we are saying, can we get all our young girls um, vaccinated? We have hepatitis B leading to, li leading to liver cancer. Can everyone get vaccinated for hepatitis B? And we're reducing that 40% of the cancer burden that we are currently having. And if you move from that, from um, prevention and um, early detection, then you come to screening. So screening is trying to identify a disease before it has pre presented with any symptoms. Not all cancers can be screened for, but if you screen for breast cancer, cervical cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer, those are the top five cancers in Kenya. So you're going to reduce that burden um, significantly. And then even after a person has come for, for, uh, has been diagnosed with cancer, it's critical that we try and get them at an earlier age, earlier stage where they're uh, more likely to get cured from their disease. And even if they come in stage three and four disease, there's still so much we can do. As you can see from uh, the late professor, he had stage three, then stage four cancer, but he still had a significant quality lifespan. So even those patients who have advanced disease, there's still so much you can do to prevent their, their pain and, and their suffering. Before I come to you, Ms. Husna, um, Moses, we, we have at least 49 oncologists. That's, of course, according to uh, Kenya Society of Hematology and Oncology. We have at least 45 oncologists in the country to serve a possible 50 million population. Do you think we have enough resources as a country, as someone who's advocating about and creating awareness about this disease? Do you think this is enough? That's not enough because 40, is it 40? 45. 45. Across the nation. And we have new cancer cases each and every day. It's not enough. We need more oncologists, like human resource. We need more. Like we can have in a situation that maybe 10 patients or 100 patients per one oncologist. That's, I think that can work. Something that's workable. But now that number, no, no. That's still low, and we need. Mr. Sna, um, what were your take homes from that situation? What is that thing that is your take home? It's it's one lesson that you learned from that situation. That is one. But before you answer that, do you think it's time to declare this disease a national disaster and have all guns blazing against it? put majority of government resources to go out, just as the president said. Maybe it's time to double our efforts. Um, I think it's time to double the efforts because if you look at it, my husband's case is because we could access a quality hospital with specialized doctors who are around him. But if you look at the majority of Kenyans, it's like the affordability comes in question. Two, if you know I just have cancer, you know me, I'm gone. Because even managing yourself has to be seen is a problem. Where do you go to be seen the way Omondi said it's, it's a problem for us? 
if you don't have money, who is going to see you without money? So I think that the government has to double up the efforts because it's a real disaster now. Every family you find two or three cases of cancer, you know, and for them to be maintained, to be given the proper services for uh, such cases, it's not manageable because you find from the food, treatment, doctors to see you, it's going to cost a lot for you. And my take home is uh, you find you have cancer, it's not a life death sentence for you. It depends with how you manage yourself. Positivity matters a lot because within the eight years my husband was able to achieve a lot even becoming a professor alhamdulillah and usually when somebody knows you have such a thing they give up so that spirit of not giving up is one thing for us to keep up going. Two is like families, they need that counseling services because if you don't know how to manage and handle your, your sick family member, it becomes another thing altogether and that emotional support, you need it. And at the end of the day, in believing and trusting in God because God has its, his own blessings, he has a way of carrying you through and the strength that he gives you at such a time, it's amazing. And I always remain grateful for the friends who are around us because they never let us down. Can I um, interject that? Sure. You know, when you were showing the clip of the president, he was talking about coming up with um, a policy for cancer. I mean, we've been working a lot with the Ministry of Health. There's already the National Cancer Prevention and Control Act. And there's already like a national cancer control strategy. Uh, the challenge we have is that we have no funding to operationalize that, um, that um, strategy. So you already have all these documents in, uh, in place, but we're just not putting um, the resources to actually make sure that these strategies are put in place. So when he's saying we are doubling the efforts, I think that um, they should look at the things that stakeholders including oncologists, the Ministry of Health and uh, cancer survivors have put in to develop these strategies and actually provide those that bud budgetary allocation for us to actually provide this um, service. That then, is mm -hmm. sorry, the other thing is that um, we already have a National Hospital Insurance Fund that during the time that Moses was accessing care was not available but uh, from I think 2017 there's been a lot of um, work that they have done, but there's still a lot more that the National Hospital Insurance Fund can do to actually improve um, access to, to cancer care for patients. Still on that, Dr. there yeah. was a strategy plan that was developed for the year 2011 to 2016. Right. And it's Nothing 2019, happened. and yeah. we haven't yeah. seen the report yeah. on yeah. that because it was yeah. a time-bound strategic exactly. plan, and yeah. we have not seen the report on that. So, so putting up another team for another strategy exactly. for another year, I think, yeah. and we haven't seen the report for the previous strategic plan. Yeah. I mean, I tell you. So I've I've had the opportunity to work uh, on the 2017, 2022, 2022 strategic plan. Mm -hmm. So what we do is you bring a team of experts together, both at the um, at like oncologists. Yes. You have the civil society. You have the Ministry of Health to sit down and bring the strategies and say, okay, we need four cancer centers within um, uh, four regions. So Kisi, Mombasa, I think, and two other places. That strategy was there like maybe 15 years ago. Nothing has happened That's because we I mean don't have, we have not been given, you're not providing the funding to actualize it. So I think it's uh, kind of like, um, uh, unfortunately, only when someone prominent dies is when you start, people start becoming emotive about cancer. Yet there are a lot of people like Moses and other people who, I mean, are working hard to bring the strategies and then when you go and ask for, we need funding for this, and you're like, we don't have a budgetary allocation. So if we don't actually take seriously the things that people are working on, five years from now, we'll be talking about the same thing. So 2018 alone, we yeah. have the Ministry of uh, Health, yeah. to like at least two billion. We have the county government, at yeah. least 1.3 billion. Yeah. And I mean, I'm so failing to understand. Yeah, so Faisal, I think that what we'll do is we'll fact check next year yes. in 
for 2nd of August and see have they actually uh, put money where their mouths are, you know, like saying, we are, they've said today we are going to give you two billion to do this. One year from now, we need to do this story again and say, how much have they actually done? So we need them yeah. on the set. Exactly. But, but even at the end of the day, it's like if they say they do it, where is the accountability? Exactly. Uh, is the funds reaching the people who we need it. it, you know? Because if you're poor, you're from Kibra, you don't have the idea, you don't have the information, that means you're, you're just going to die like that. But if the county governments plus the national governments are going to work together and make sure that in each and every county this... Uh, patients are going to access medication it's key because once you have cancer it's like all your body joints are aching you just need a reliever and if you cannot ha afford food how are you going to afford your medication so i think it's about accountability and transparency if they allocate they're able to publicize about it let people know where you can go who do, who seeks and follows up on you because at the end of the day if you go home and you're not able to go back to the hospital what mechanism is there to do these follow-ups of which as a government i think it's high time you put your resources there because if you're going to be losing professionals that is a lot Forty-seven thousand is quite a lot to be losing every year because yeah. of cancer True. and the yeah. president again just earlier on uh, this afternoon uh, announced at the funeral of course that uh, at least 10 chemo centers are going to be put up across the country. We have uh, Bomet, Mombasa, Kisumu, Garissa, Nakuru, Meru, and Machakos. He promised four radiology centers in Bomet, Garissa, Mombasa, and Nakuru. And uh, he promised the first lifting of the Kenyatta University Hospital that's basically going to enhance uh, the cancer knowledge and awareness within the country. So we're just hoping that's yeah. going to come into reality. I mean, I, I just want to say that this is something that's been on the cards for many years. Mm -hmm. It's uh, So it's kind of like a, a broken promise. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, because mm -hmm. the, the, the four cancer uh, radiotherapy centers, that's something that was in the first strategic plan in 2011, 2016. So we really haven't moved in that direction. So that's why I'm telling you we need to just fact check this in a year to see whether it's actually been actualized. Mr. President, I think I need an interview with you. Please, let's have this discussion. Mr. President, if I can get you, please, the Fadali, just give me Cecil Kariuki, the Minister of uh, Health. Let's have this discussion and discuss about this thing. You came here, we welcomed you, thank you so much, and we really do appreciate the Fadali. This is an request i'm making it on air that please let's have a sit down and uh, let's discuss this menace is it time to declare it a national disaster so that maybe we can put more government resources to handle this disaster moses maybe your party should have been quite silent <laughs> <laughs> i was just listening so what i can say is we shouldn't work with the emotions this is a face now everyone is like we are sad because of the two prominent people who have passed on that's why we are all over media saying it should be a national disaster but it's not it's not just a word of mouth it needs more budgetary allocation mm -hmm. so what i can say is let's work with what we have what we need is just the resources and then if we implement that maybe an, the next step we can take is declaring it a national disaster but for now let's wait for this phase to move and now act with our normal feelings not what we feel because of the two prominent people of Pastor. Lovely. Um, maybe just to go through very few tweets before we call it a wrap. It has been truly an emotive show. I have uh, at M underscore to say, Fasal Kassim, the government should prioritize health care to her citizens. Uh, Kenya is doing too little. Ministry of Health, Kenya is doing too little. Our foods are infiltrated by carcinogenic materials that are killing Kenyans. We should not wait until politicians die and come up with knee jerk reactions. Basically, what our brother Moses was saying. I mean, a lot of other comments coming in, but again, we have uh, quite a few time to talk about that. We have a lot of cases that are affecting us, affecting your neighbor, your brother, your sister, anyone from your family. She said, straight from the horse's mouth, that uh, among the things they really need is that emotional and solidarity support. So 
there are people that are suffering and maybe that you know of them. What are you doing? We are here pointing fingers to maybe the government and the policy makers. But again, you as a neighbor, you as a family friend, you as a colleague, you as a friend, what are you doing to try and solve this? I've been your host, Faisal Qasim, and this is a live real talk. See you next week, same place, same time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much. Santa Thank you so much. You're watching.